Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Adams Brothers podcast. We are here this evening with retired Sergeant Major Lynette Wright. She was uh, in the United States Marine Corps for 30 years. She joined the Marine Corps in March of uh, 1989, and she retired as a Sergeant Major in March of 2019. Uh, Lynette, We've been, we were talking off camera and we were talking about Deerfield and Boca and she went to Boca High School and she graduated in 1987, but she also lived in Deerfield Beach, Florida. And we used to work together at Popeye's years ago. So some, some people wanted to say, no, she's from Boca. No, she's from Deerfield, but look, we're going to, we're going to share you. I know the people up in Boca. In Palm Beach County, yeah. want to. Where, where so, I'm from both. Let's just say that. I'm from you, both because I spent half my day going to school in Boca Raton and I spent my night sleeping in Deerfield. So I'm from both. Yeah, you know? You're from both. So we'd like to welcome retired Sergeant Major Lynette Wright from the United States Marine Corps to the Adams Brothers podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, thank you, you know, thank you. We, Thank uh, you for joining us. Uh, so good to see you. Uh, we lost, really lost contact with you for so many years while you were in the core. And yeah. we didn't, we didn't know much about where you were. We didn't really know much about Google back then, but towards yeah. the end of your career, we found you and we, we, my brother Wayne highlighted you on his, uh, his, his, his Facebook page. Oh, thank you so much. You know, uh, you don't know how you're going to end up when you when you join the military you know i just knew i needed to do something so joining the marine corps you know was a uh it wasn't a quick decision i knew i was going to join the military but i chose the marine corps because a buddy of mine who i went to high school with you know said we were going on a buddy program um of course he joined right after high school but i kind of hung out for a while for two years and then joined when i was 20. Um, but I knew I was going to join. But uh, yeah, when you when you get into the military, you, you kind of lose track of everyone, you know, right. and things that were going on. When I first joined back in 89, you know, I, my first duty station was overseas in Okinawa, Japan. And then right after that, in 2000 in 1990 is when the Gulf War kicked off. So that kind of um, took me to that location over in um, the Gulf War when I got to California. But as a young Marine, you know, you just have a good time and you don't even realize that the time has passed. And those first four years were fast and furious right. for me. Right. And so, it's funny, it, 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 before you get, get, get a little bit uh, too far, it's it, I have a little story to share about the Marine Corps because I almost joined the Marine Corps myself. Okay. And I was, I was at Deerfield High School and there was a recruiter there named Sergeant Forbes. I don't know if you know him. I can't remember his first name, but he was at Deerfield High. He was a black guy. And he used to try, he used to see me in the hallways every day. And he was like, I want you to join the Marine Corps. So finally I said, you know what? I am going to join. And he said that, uh, well, okay, well, I'm gonna come by your house. And I said, okay, I gave him my address and everything. And just, it was one Saturday morning, I'll never forget. He did come to my my grandmother's house where we were living over there behind the club Bailey over there right. by, down the road from the American Legion. We were living in that old wooden house there and he pulled up there and uh, he got out the car. My grandmother, Ira Adams, my, my dad's mother, she, he saw this guy getting out and she was like, who is this military guy coming here? And I said that uh, he's coming here for me. I, I'm going to join the Marine Corps. And she, she, she almost had a heart attack. She says, no, 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 no. You are not joining the Marine Corps. She said, they killed my brother in the, in the, in the U.S. Army. We have not found him to this day. And oh. they're not going to kill my damn grandson. And he, you are not going anywhere. And she told that guy, she said, if you don't get off my property, I'm going to get my 38 and I'm going to blow you away. My son is not going to no Marine Corps and you're not going to kill my, my grandson. And Oh, wow. She almost that, had a heart attack. And she was like, if you go, I'm going to have a heart attack because to this day, we don't know what happened to her brother. Oh, wow. You and know, he, and it's funny honor. because um, when I joined, uh, I didn't tell my parents I had joined. Right. I just told a recruiter, I'm joining. You don't have to babysit me. Just give uh -huh. me a quick date, you know, to ship. 
And I, I, I did it that way because I had started trying to find careers when I got out of the high school and I really wanted to be a flight attendant. And so I had a lady come to the school, come to the house for an interview for a flight attendant school. And she interviewed me and my dad right there in Deerfield on first court. And she asked him some questions. She asked me some questions. She had me write an essay. And so I gave her the essay. I wrote it right there on the spot. And then she said, you're a great candidate for, you know, for a flight attendant and everything. And so she said she'll be in touch. So the lady left. As Soon as that lady got out the door, my dad was like, I don't want you being no flight attendant. It's too dangerous. Planes crash. So when I joined the Marine Corps, I didn't tell him until the day I was walking out the door with my bag. And I told him, I said, OK, I'm going to boot camp. I'll see you all in about three months. Um, so. My dad looked at my mom and asked, did you know she had joined the Marine Corps? My mom was like, I didn't know, you know, but uh, yeah, I didn't tell him until I walked out the door with my bag with the recruiter that I was going to boot camp right. because I knew my dad would have been like, if he wasn't going to let me be a flight attendant, he definitely wasn't going to let me join He didn't want Corps. you to be in the Marine Corps. It sounds just like but my grandmother. Yeah, but you know what? Um, my two uncles, his two brothers were in the war, as you know, in Vietnam, but when he came to my graduation, you know, that was the proudest moment for me because, you know, I think that just wiped away all his fears because and um, when they came to Paris Island for my graduation, I was the highest shooter out of my platoon, you know, on the rifle, on the rifle. And so they treated them like VIPs when they came because I was the highest shooter. And, uh, you know, they was asking him all kinds of questions like, where did she learn to shoot at? He's like, I don't know. All I know is she know how to fish, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, I I was hesitant too about telling my parents I was joining the Marines. So you went to tr uh, basic training, uh, of course, at what Paris Island, South at Carolina. Paris Island. Yep, Paris Island, Paris Island, at Paris yeah. Island, South and Carolina. yeah, South Carolina. And then when you graduated uh, from uh, boot camp, where did you go from there? So after boot camp, uh, I ju I had my and my job became communications. So I was a communicator, and they call it a comm center operator. I didn't know what that was, but the school was in Twenty Nine Palms, California, and if you don't know the Mo Twenty Nine Palms, it's the Mojave Desert, mm -hmm. and it is a desert. And uh, so that's where my school was, and I went to school over there for about five months, um, becoming a communicator. Uh, joined after I got after I graduated communication school. I went to Okinawa, Japan, my first duty station, and then there in uh, Okinawa, Japan, I was assigned to the communication center operations for First Marine Division, uh, Third Marine Division. I take that back. Third Marine Division there on Courtney uh, Camp Courtney in Okinawa. And so that was my first duty station. Yeah, I had a one year tour over there, and it was fabulous. You know. Uh, being young and, you know, being away from home, I really enjoyed it. Uh, worked a lot of hours, but however, it was, it was very uh, enjoyable. Yep. And so you did a one-year tour back in those days. They didn't make you go for two years like they do now. So Right, right. And I was just going to ask you, how long did you, you spend in uh, uh, Japan? But you answered that. So when you left Okinawa, where did, where, where did they station you at then? I went to Camp Pendleton, California. After that, uh, I wanted to come back to the East Coast, but you know, when you're young like that, they tell you where you're going. Um, so I ended up at Camp Pendleton, California, right there in Oceanside. So there I was assigned to uh, first MLG, where you know I was assigned to a communications company called Headquarters, Headquarters Battalion. So when I got there, uh, it was it was a huge company. Uh, the Gulf War was getting ready to kick off, and they start sending troops over. Uh, but at that time, you know, women didn't get shipped off like the guys did, so a lot of us stayed behind. Uh, so when they realized they needed more forces and they needed more, you know, certain job skills over in in Desert Storm and over in Saudi Arabia. Guess who they had to ship? They had to ship the women because we were the last communicators in the company to support, you know, the units. Um, so when we, when I shipped out for Saudi Arabia for 
uh, Desert Storm, Desert Shield, the entire shipment of that company was women. We all got shipped out. We were so excited because before we would we wouldn't get shipped out like the guys, but we wanted to go and be part of the dog on fight also. Right. So, but when they said we were going, we were cheering, clapping. You know, the supervisors were they weren't happy about it because now they got to put women out there, you know, but we were ready for it. And so when we shipped and we landed over in Saudi Arabia on the port of Jabal, it was it was empty. We were the first shipment of women over there as a communications detachment, and we were excited. Um, all of us was young. It had to be about 20 of us, but you know that's how we ended up in Desert Storm because at that point they needed all the skill sets that, that they needed. You know, like communicators, you know, to support the forces. So they had to send us. So that was a big break for women at that particular time um, because. It, at no other time had the Corps been tested on, you know, how well, how well they can support women in a combat environment and how, you know, women will perform in a combat environment, you know, so that was huge for us as women. So that's why we were all excited about it because, you know, they will keep us in the rear as they call it a lot of times. So that was huge for us to be the first group of women you know, to go out and, to, and be in Saudi Arabia. So I did a tour over there. Uh, I think when the war kicked off, I was over there about seven months. Seven months, okay. And you spent seven months at, in Saudi Arabia. And after the tour in Saudi Arabia, did they ship you back to the U.S.? Oh, man, after the Saudi Arabia tour, you know, um, so Desert Storm and Desert Shield, I, um, I don't know if you remember or not, there was two phases, Desert Storm and Desert Shield. Right. And then uh, when we came, when they started to retrograde back, we came back, but then they needed support to retrograde all the equipment back, all the forces back, and that takes what? Communication. So I ended up going back to Saudi Arabia again for retrograde. Um, so I was back for about I'll say about, I, I wouldn't even back a good six months before I was headed back over for the retrograde, um, back to the same port of Jabal right there in Saudi Arabia. And um, after that, we, we, we toured back after the retrograde, but then there was, there was some additional uh, support needed. Guess what? I went back again. So I did three tours over in um, Saudi Arabia for Desert Storm, Desert Shield, whether I was, it was during, it was prior to Desert Storm, Desert Shield, during Desert Storm, Desert Shield, and then after during the retrograde. So I had three phases. Uh, I was in all the phases for that. Um, so after that, you know, I ended my tour. That was, that took up so much of my time that it took up a lot of the first two and a half years, three years of my time in the Marine Corps, it was just so fast moving. And, you know, I got back from my third tour in Saudi Arabia and guess what? I started, you know, doing other operations uh, over in Kuwait, um, doing uh, MPF offloads, which is Maritime Prepositioning Forces. And then Somalia kicked off. So guess where I ended up? I ended up like later on in my career, back over in, uh, and I shouldn't play back, but over in Sali, uh, Somalia, again, at another port um, there in Somalia, Sali, Somalia. Again, we were one of the first forces there to set up communication. So I did a tour in, Sada, in Somalia. Then uh, that, that was pretty interesting because Sali, Somalia was the first time, you know, after all the little exercise operations I had been on, Somalia was special because it was in Africa. Africa. You know, it was, you know, seeing people of our skin color, you know, and- the you motherland. Know, being close, yeah, being close to that. And when I say it was such a great feeling to be there, to know that we were helping and we were trying to make, you know, a way for some of the people. So the, the purpose, of, Somalia started out to where, uh, you know, Somalia was based around the, the warlords uh, controlling certain parts of the country. It was it was devastated. It was devastation everywhere. But the biggest thing was trying to get support and supplies to those outland 
areas for those uh, people, refugees and stuff. So a lot of times they were doing escort missions to go out there. Um, but, you know, to get to see the people, meet some of the people and the kids, oh my God, they were just beautiful. They would see, so we were in a compound, but the kids would come up to the other side of the other side of the gate. You can't see them, but they'll just sing and sing and it is beautiful voices and they would just sing. And then, you know, we might throw an apple over it. We were not supposed to feed them, but we might throw an apple over right, there. Right. Uh -huh. But that to me was one of the most special times was being in Somalia for me. Uh, was, that, my, was that after the the uh, they had shot the uh, the helicopters no, down that was or, or was that, that before? Oh, that was way before. Okay. Now, you know, I'm a Marine. So, you know, Marines land first, right? right we land first. <laughs> so that's what we do. We land first and then we prepare the area for oncoming forces in the army are more stabilized you know they, they just like there. Debo from Friday yeah. you just go take what you all want and then y'all just you know just just pull up huh <laughs> yeah, yeah but that's what you know that's what we do so it was okay. pretty Mogadishu port is where I was stationed in Somalia right there again right. you know so that was that was that was kind of the, the encompassment of my first four years you know um which was pretty pretty amazing for me right and at, go ahead, Wayne. And uh, in, with the mission in Somalia being that was before uh, the Black Hawk incident, uh, what kind of mission was that? Was that uh, pretty much like uh, 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 training or peacekeeping or? No, no, no. Uh, so it starts out as uh, it starts out as humanitarian per se, but it's just getting there and establishing the foundation. So we were at the port of Jabal. So we had to set up communication, I mean, port of Mogadishu, set up communication because at the ports, if you notice, I've been at two different ports. Ships come in, supplies come in. So that's that's like an entry point. So that area has to be secured. It has to have communications to communicate with the ships and things coming in. So that was, it started out as more of like a slightly humanitarian. It wasn't designated as one, but it started out as that um, to prepare the area for oncoming forces. And the first thing you get is the ships coming in. Um, so it wasn't a combat mission. It wasn't a uh, per se or humanitarian. It wasn't designated as humanitarian, but it's more like a preparation. It's not a training. It's a real live event. Um, so that is how it, start, it started before any of those army forces got there, Black House got there, all that. It was the Marines that were there, you know, keeping security, keeping things, you know, in line. Um, and you want to know one of the craziest things because the locals are so excited and you they're so excited when they see Marines come because they know that it's going to be, you know, it's going to be someone who's going to be there to help them. Someone there that's going to, you know, make sure they get what they need. So when it was time for us to pull out, when I say us, the Marines, to pull out and turn over to the Army, you know, the people blockade the airports. We had to hide in the bed of, of the of the five-ton trucks so they didn't see us leaving. You know, once they see all those forces leaving, they would blockade everything because they didn't want the Marines to leave. They just didn't have that much... They had that much trust and confidence that they were being taken care of, you know. And uh, they, I don't think they got the grasp of that the army was the fixation that was going to be there to take over everything. They just saw us leaving and thought that, oh my God, they're leaving. And they would blockade the airport. We had to leave in the middle of the night, you know. They were just so destitute. And I say, I've never seen such a devastation before in my life. It still is memory in my mind how devastating it was there in Somalia, you know? Um, but that was that was a pretty special um, time for me. And my first four years, cause that's my first exposure to a military lifestyle. And it was so fast and furious with all that, you know? So a lot of my wars you see on my, on my ribbons and on my uniform, a lot of that came from my first four years because of all the exercise, all the missions, all those things I was part of. So as a young Marine, you know, only being like a E3 or E4, E4 people would ask like, how she get all those ribbons on her uniform, you know? It's because, you know, it just 
fell that way to where I was part of all those different types of exercises and things um, at that, that particular time, my first four years. So it was, it was pretty significant um, for me. How was, how also, how well received were the women at that time uh, uh, from the men? What was the reception like uh, back then? Was it? Uh, in which environment? In, in the in the exercise environment or in the? Yeah, the overall environment when women started so, like combat uh, or at first. Uh, so I would say that, um, Okay, let me give you an example. When we got off the plane and landed in the port of J Jabal, there was a sergeant major there, an old crusty guy, white, tall guy. <laughs> and he, well, as we got off the plane, he corralled us all up and he just laid into us about what we will do, what we won't do, what he don't, he don't believe us to be there, and I ain't gonna use the foul language he used, but he just thought that we didn't belong there. But, you know, it wasn't his call. It, he was pretty much not acceptance of us being in that environment, you know? But again, like I say, it was the first time the Marine Corps had even deployed women of that number before. Um, so he was against it. It was a lot of senior people, those ones that were back in Vietnam and things like that, they don't, they don't accept that stuff. Um, and we'll talk about that later in my career, but that they, they weren't very receptive of it. Um, but they knew we had to be there because we were there and we had this job to do. So, I mean, it was pretty, pretty amazing because we, we were pretty tight to this day. I'm still tight with a lot of the girls that was in um, Desert Storm with me, you know, um, we we're still close. You know, we call ourselves bunker buddies because when the scud missiles would go off, we were all <laughs> running to the bunker, you know, with our all our equipment and stuff on. So we're bunker, we're bunker buddies. You know I mean, it was tough, but we all stuck together. Um, so, but yeah, it wasn't, I can't, I can't say that it was a bad experience because of my gender. It wasn't. Um, it's expected. You know, you have that percentage that don't don't believe women belong. Um, but at the same time, you have those who are professionals and know that, you know, hey, they're here to do a job just like everybody else. And you were going to treat them with respect. So I commend the Marine Corps about that because Marine Corps was very, very, uh, I don't want to say coddling about us, but they were very strict about where we slept where we uh, took a shower, we had our own shower, we had our own sleeping areas, you know, they had made sure that it was a sign off limits, you know, where we went to the bathroom, we had our own porta johns So they kind of made sure that we had our own because, you know, people will be, you know, messy. And right. so in that aspect, now when I went to Somalia, my first, that was my first time being around the army. Now in the Marines, we always knew that, hey, the girls over here, boys over there. But in Somalia, the army came into that same port where I told you we were. They were sleeping in, in cots next to each other, with each other. They co-mingled the genders. And it was just like, they were playing house in, in the warehouse, you know, they where they were sleeping with each other and sleeping, I shouldn't say nothing fast, but I'm saying right. sleeping on top of each other. There was no designation. So I think that they had more problems than we did when it came to like sexual harassment and things like that, because growing up in a segregated environment in a combat environment, it made us aware that, hey, you know, we got to stay professional. We got to stay away from, you know, those types of things. And I think, um, you call it strict if you want, but I thought it was a good thing for me as a young girl because it kept us tight. It kept us together, you know. Now, did some things go on? Yeah, some things went on. But for the most part, you know, we didn't have those peeping toms, you know, that stuff. We didn't have those, you know, coming in and, you know, trying to sexual assault. We didn't have all that because we were all very um, secluded and we had our own security. Um and that, and that, that was in the first part of it all. So I, I heard you say uh, that you met a lot of good friends 
while you were in the Marine Corps and um, and you had some bunker buddies. And I hope the question I'm going to ask you is no. But did at any time in your career in, in the Marine Corps, did you ever lose a good friend that you had met while you were in the Marine Corps? Did you ever witness any of your good friends lose their life? I sure have. I, I, sure did, I didn't want to. I, I was hoping you would say no, but a, a 30 year career. Yeah. I, sure have. I mean, I, I mean, you're going to bring me to tears because I sure have. Well, I don't, we don't want to bring you to tears, but uh, I, I mean, I, I've heard I, I work with the guy and he shared a story with me about his best buddy in the Marine Corps. And uh, it was pretty graphic, you know, to see that, you know, that young men and women go out and put their lives on the line and they lose their lives right in front of people that they met. They didn't even know when they went to the, the Corps or the Army or the Navy or whatever. And, hey. to, and to see someone lose their life right next to you or get blown away, that's that's just like tragic. You know what I'm saying? It's it's it, it, it stays with you for the rest of your life. It does. Yeah. I mean, and you know it, it, it you know it can happen but you don't expect it to happen when i say marines we train like we fight we train like we fight and so the training and you know every experience that they give you they try to make it as realistic as possible but that they can't make that realistic they they can't make that realistic but when it comes to training you know being in a, a a simulated environment, a combat, they can do that. But what they can't simulate is the smell, the 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 smoke. They can't, you know, the the visuals. You know, they can't simulate all that. You know, they the the sounds, they can't. And those are things that you know mostly affect that make it the real realistic part of it. Um, you know, listen to the bombs go off, the, you know, the rifle going off, you know, that stuff, you know, you can hear that, you know, that it's, it, it startles you. But when you combine all those things, what they call fog of war, when you combine it all, it's nothing, it's nothing that can prepare you for that. Because people who you expect to be tough guys, they not tough guys when that type of environment happens. The ones who you don't think are tough guys who can, who, who can rise to the occasion, those are the ones that rise to occasion many times. But that's why they stress so much about training because if you're confident in your training and everything, you'll be confident when you go into those environments. That's why training is so important, you know, and Marine Corps is so, I wanna say head being known, you know, being, you know, realistic as possible. They might call us brainwashed sometimes, but you know, you got to prepare people because they could lose their lives. When people don't train properly, you know, other people could die. How is racism in the military? Do you experience a lot of racism or how is it in oh, the military yeah. as far as racism? Oh, yes. Hey, remember the people who join the military are the same people that is walking on the street next to you. You know, they come in the military with their same beliefs. They come in the military with the same biases. They come in the Marine Corps with their same hatreds and their same prejudices. So it's there, it's there. Now, do we try to curve it? Yeah, we try to curve it, you know? And when you're in a leadership position, you have to really enforce that, hey, you might never seen a black person before, but guess what? This black woman here is the one that's responsible for your ass. I'm the one that's gonna be responsible for your life. So you need to listen to what I'm telling you. You know, I'm the one that's gonna make sure you get eat, pay and stay alive, you know? So you, you try to break down those prejudices and tell them that, you know, that life you had, and I'm talking about young Marines now, the ones who've been in for a while, they go back to their old ways. But when they when you first get them, that's the time you have to make an impression on them. That's what that's what a lot of the boot camp is about. Marine Corps boot camp is it's tough physically, but it's more tough mentally because they want you to break down a lot of those things that you know you may have grew up around. You know to let you know, hey, that guy next to you, that might be the guy who saved your life. You know, 
that girl next to you, that might be the girl who saved your life. You know, you just never know what environment. And I have to say, I'm pretty proud that, you know, when we do get in those kind of, you know, dangerous environments, everything goes out the window. When you over in a foreign country and, you know, you only got each other, those things go out the window quickly. Oh, absolutely. So yes, it's there. And just like you said to your left and right, but I, I want to say Marine Corps is pretty good about stomping it out as, as much as possible, but you'll get those ones in key positions who go back and revert to their old ways and they, they try to be undercover with it. They try to be undercover with it, but it comes out, they, the colors come out, but for the most part, it's, it wasn't a bad environment for me when it came to that. Yeah, because I read plenty of articles here, especially within the last four years about uh, the mili- the branches of the military being infiltrated by white supremacist groups, hate groups. And I had always wondered about that. Yeah, so that stuff is not tolerated in the Marine Corps. I don't know about the other service, but if you're part of any kind of a gang or any kind of organization in that matter, that they, they will separate you because obviously you have a different agenda and you're not there to provide, you know, there to, to uh, do the job of a Marine. So that stuff, they'll separate them for that. They, I mean, they can't even have a tattoo. Um, uh, but yeah. Yeah, they'll, they'll weed those out and separate them. So they just go deeper under cover, but that stuff ain't visible. They can't even, you know how people ride around with flags all on the back of their vehicles? Can't do that on base. No, can't do that on base. So they they try to curve it, but those are the ones you really want to just get out. I don't even know why people like that join the military because the military is diverse and it it, it really needs to reflect American society. You know, it don't That's make right. sense when, you know, um, America has this many minorities, but then we don't have, you know, a four star black general yet in the Marine Corps. We've never had one. Wow. Other service have had one, but we haven't. And why do you think that has been besides uh not let's let's not even say racism other than that. What do you think besides that, uh why we haven't had a four star general in the uh Marines? You know, that realm is the officer realm. I can't tell you, but you know, it's just I think it's the same old thing, you know. Mm-hmm. You you know what I mean when I say the same yeah. old thing. You right, know? right. Too much power, you know. Just can't handle, you know, what's being in a, in that type of position, and you know, and people hold you back. They'll hold you back, you know, when you, especially when you got somebody doing your evaluation, somebody who's got to vouch for you, especially at those levels. You know, I don't know that level, but I know for me, um, I I think for me, my 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 experience, my, my record, there was no way they could ha- not have given me the job that I got because I had so much experience in it. And to tell me no would have been, you know, blatant, blatant, you know, disregard because of my gender or who I was. A Sergeant Major, is that like in an administrative role, is that like middle? in the middle of management or near the top or where so, where where along that scale is like a sergeant major so sergeant majors are uh senior enlisted advisors so in the in the military you have enlisted service members and you have officers so on the enlisted side we just talked about generals that's the officer side on the enlisted side the senior rank of the enlisted side is an E-9, which is a sergeant major or either a master gunnery sergeant in the Marine Corps. So we have E-9s in the Marine Corps that some people are master gunnery sergeants and they're technical experts within their MOS and within their jobs. Sergeant majors are more administrative, but they hold more of a leadership position and they are advisors to the commander. So that's the role I chose after leaving communications. You have to pick that road you want to be in. So let's just say you two are you two are a company. Well, let's just say I'm your senior advisor to the commander. 
So if you all have a problem, then you come to me with your with your problem. You know, I take care of you, your welfare and your well-being. So leadership role and more administrative. So I take care of the enlisted side. So when it comes to sergeant majors, there are different job positions you can hold as a sergeant major. You can hold a sergeant major. You can hold a position at a battalion level. You can hold a sergeant major position at a regiment level. And you can, you can continue to go up all the way to the general level where I, I ended up. Now, the position that I held as a Marine Expeditionary Unit, that's a whole nother round. Because if you know anything about the Marine Corps, you know we are land, air, and sea. So a Marine Expeditionary has those three components in it. They call it a, a Marine Air Task Force. That's the fighting force for any operation that the Marine Corps may go into. They have to have that. They have to have air. They have to have ground forces. They need combat support element. So the Marine Expeditionary Unit, the one that I ended up being assigned to as a SAR major that made, made it such a historical thing, a woman has never been assigned to that position as a senior enlisted advisor to a commander. So and you were the first one? I was the first one. I was the first one. So th that in itself kind of signified that, oh my God, people just lost their mind. Like, oh my God, she's in charge of combat forces. No, I'm just a senior enlisted advisor to the commander. The commander is the combat commander. So that's what made it so historic because again, we didn't, we've never had a woman hold that position. Oh, but that was major hold, barriers. That was major yeah. barriers to be but, broken down. Yeah, we done got to the end of the career, you know, because before all that, we, we stopped at my first four years, my second four years, I was a Marine security guard. I worked at the embassy in Bridgetown, Barbados. Mm -hmm. I worked at the embassy in uh, Hong Kong, China. I worked at the embassy in um, Australia, Canberra, Australia. I worked at the embassy in Tokyo, Japan. So as a Marine security guard, you know, they control the interior security of the embassies. And those are the four embassies where I served. Um, that was a fun tour. So that's what I did my second four years in the Marine Corps. I wanted to be a Marine security guard because, you know, I just was having such a good time, you know, thinking I'm a true warfighter. Now that I got all this time and <laughs> Desert Storm, Desert Shell, you know, and I was just, you know, I was being a go getter. And I said, yeah. I wanted to be a Marine security guard. So I was a Marine security guard, did that, served at those different embassies. Those was great experiences to be part of the diplomat community to see how, you know, American projects their, you know, themselves overseas and, you know, just how we function as America overseas. So that was pretty interesting also, you know. So you tell anybody when they travel overseas, please register with the American Embassy so we know you're in the country. Right. They, hey, because you ain't gonna get, you want to get out if something happens. That's good information. Yeah, that's, yeah, and that's good advice because I yeah, I've really been out of the yeah, country you know, a couple of people, times. People just travel and they, they don't want to register with the American Embassy and stuff. But, you know, if, if things hit the fan, you want to be accounted for. You know, if right. you lose your passport, you want to be accounted for. You know, you want you want you want that protection, you know, knowing that uh, you can go to the embassy and find that help. Because on embassy duty, so many times Americans will get themselves in trouble or get themselves uh, stranded, you know, and can't get home, you know, and they got to wait until someone from the embassy can either come in the next day at work or, you know, help them some kind of way. But by that time, the cruise ship is gone, you know, they stranded on whatever. So please register with the American Embassy. That's, a, that's some really good advice. I I, I I never knew that. If I go to Jamaica right now and I don't 
You know, for some reason. Oh, you can swim back from Jamaica, though. That ain't that <laughs> nah. you, you can swim back from there. But you you need to register at the American Embassy if you're going to be there, let's say, for a month, right? It's good, yeah, it's, it's good to would, go I, and register. I, I, would, I, register. I register anywhere I go. I right. want somebody to know where I am. Can you do it I'm online? Oh, yeah. you have to go there. Yeah. You have to go directly no, you there. You do it online. You do it online. Okay. You do it online. You know, if I fall off a boat somewhere, I want somebody to know where my last position was. Right. You know, it's just, you know, security. But yeah, embassy duty was fantastic. Yeah, you know, so I enjoyed that. Got a lot of good experiences from that, you know, working at the right. uh, embassies and stuff. Right. And, and since you mentioned security, uh, what's your opinion on the military? Like during 2020, the summer of 2020, we seen the protests, a lot of protests throughout the country with the uh, justice protest. Uh, how do you feel? Do you think the military is, because, uh, you know, people on the news was making a big distinction, like the military, people were not trained to handle the uh, protest crowds. Uh, how do you feel about the military uh, putting their personnel in uh, civil uh, disturbances like that went on during the summer of 2020. And I'm quite sure we're going to see more in the future. Uh, how do you, you feel say, about that? When you say uh, the protests, you mean here on American soil? Yes, on American soil. I'm sorry. That's what I wanted we would, to say. We should never put military forces on American soil. Never. That's not yeah. what That's not what the military is for. It's yes. not for fun here at home. We should never and um, that, that's a that's a huge no no. We would that's never more, put air forces. You would never see a tank riding down, you know, Hillsborough Boulevard. You know, you will never see that because that's not what the military is for. That would it's be for, more like for the uh, National Guard, correct? National Guard goes in. Yes, that's their responsibility. That's a whole different realm. Um, Homeland Security. That's all there. They do national stuff. Um, Military forces are for global security. Yeah, because you see a lot now during these protests, you see a lot of military uh, supplies there now, the armored uh, personnel vehicles and uh, a might lot of people. You National Guard. You see the National Guard. Right, right. Yeah, you don't see the uh, actual, you see National Guard. Those, right. those are national security forces, but you won't see you won't see Marines riding down. Uh, and see, and I remember during Hurricane Andrew of 1992, uh, they had the Marines, they had everyone in uh, Miami okay, that's for that. That's humanitarian. Humanitarian? Right. Oh, yep. yeah. They Natural would, disaster. They would do that. They would do, um, and they, you wouldn't believe, like, even with Katrina, it took a long time for them to actually you know, approved for that to be, you know, because that's just something that the, the regular armed forces aren't aren't for because mm -hmm. they have national guard. But, you know, Katrina got so out of control, they had a little bit of military force, but they, for the most part, national guard should be able to handle all that because then that, that's, that, that's, that's like, you, you're just crossing bad boundaries, you know, and there's certain, um, laws and things like that that don't allow those forces to you know to be dispersed on i don't know if y'all remember back when the last president would want to you know have a parade and had the tanks going down the road and stuff like that that was that was huge you know people were so against that because we've yeah. never never paraded our tanks like in rushes down the down the street you know, showing our military force. We don't do that. Right. You know, that's, yeah, just, right. that's just a no-no. I mean, what, what is that purpose, you know? Yeah. We don't try to put fear in American people. They need to yeah. sleep easy at night knowing that we're protecting their interests abroad somewhere, you know? Right. Yeah. So when you talk about security and uh, the protests and things like that, that's the National Guard. Mm -hmm. So that was your second, your third tour in the United States Marine Corps, um, right? Uh, my when last, you did security? Uh, my next four years, yeah, I did MSG duty. After that, I I kind of floated around, was stationed in Chicago, Illinois for about three years. Um, 
at an aviation unit there. So I lived in Chicago for a while, which was good. Hey, cold, but I lived oh. in Chicago for a while. Uh, after I left Chicago, I went back to Okinawa, Japan, so I can um, be an instructor. So I was a professional military education instructor um, for two years over there. So I used to teach professional education um, to senior staff, non-commissioned officers. Um, so I was an instructor over there in Japan again. So I went back to Japan, um, which was good. You know, again, I was just trying to find things to, you know, keep me interested, keep me busy. At the same time, I was single. I, I had no kids. So I can go do these different billets and things like that. You know, wherever there was a need, I seen that there was a need for instructors. So I applied to be an instructor. So I went to go be an instructor, professional military education, did that. And then along the way, you know, as I'm going, I'm getting promoted all the way up, you know. Um, so I, uh, after, after I did that as a uh, instructor, I came back to the United States because I had got selected for first sergeant, you know, that's the step below a sergeant major. And um, I went to Quantico, Virginia, and I spent three years there. Quantico, Virginia, um, as a first sergeant there at headquarters battalion, served there for three years. That's headquarters battalion is the headquarters for the Marine Corps also. So the company that I had was Tenant Activities Company, which was compass all of headquarters Marine Corps, all the personnel within that. Um, so I was the first sergeant for that company. Um, did that. Um, and I'm kind of like scathing over a lot of this stuff because it was just so much. Right. And after I left there, Quantico, Virginia, I ended up going to, uh, where did I go out the car? Oh, I went back to Okinawa. I went back to Okinawa. So my third tour in Okinawa, um, I went back and I, as a first sergeant, I went back. I was a first sergeant for about uh, the first eight months. And then I got selected as a sergeant major. In 2008, I got selected as a sergeant major. Uh, when I got selected as sergeant major, you know, I was assigned to a, a helicopter squadron, which was huge for me because I was excited. Now I got, I got a, you know, helicopter squadron that I can, you know, be a sergeant major for. So that was the beginning of my experience um, doing sea uh, duty because as the helicopter squadron, which was um, HMM 265, um, and you know helicopter squadron, they call them, they got, they got different um, call signs, we were the dragons. So it, as a helicopter squadron, we uh, used to do rotations on uh, deployments. So we went to, uh, we would get on ship we were doing employment and that was my first time getting on ship is with the helicopter squadron because again, like I told you, there's there's those different components of a Marine Expeditionary Tech Force. Um, um, for, so we was the aviation unit on the ship. Right. It was called the 31st MU. So that was my first MU that I actually was assigned to was the 31st Marine Expeditionary Unit in Okinawa, Japan. That was the first. And I was the ASAR major there air combat elements are major for the 31st MU. So there was a me, and then there was another guy who was the uh, ground combat element SAR major. And then there was another SAR major who was the combat element SAR major. And then you have the uh, MU SAR major who, who's in charge of all of us. So out of those three components, I was the ace on the 31st MU. Fast forward, after I did my two tour, my tours there, I did two tours with that helicopter squadron, which was huge because we had aircraft. We had 46s, 46 aircraft is the aircraft that got the two propellers on both sides. And we had uh, Cobras and we had Hueys. Um, so long story short, after I left Okinawa, I went to Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. Guess where they assigned me at when I get to Camp Lejeune, North Carolina? They assigned me to the 22nd MU. Now I'm in North Carolina assigned to 22nd Marine Expeditionary Unit. And at this time, I'm 
the combat element SAR major. So first I was the A SAR major, air combat element, and now I'm the combat element SAR major. The ground combat ele element SAR major is an infantry unit. So I knew I would never get that because that's infantry, combat, um, ground combat elements. So out of the three components of the uh, MAGTAF, I held two billets, a SAR major and a combat element SAR major. So I did, so when that, when, when I got there, the combat element over in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, the 22nd Mule, that's when Livia was going on. I don't know if you all remember uh, when Livia was going on and they were looking for- Gaddafi. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and we deployed early. We left out early, so we went. We were su we were supposed to only have a seven month tour out at sea, so we got on ship again. This time, I'm the combat element sergeant major. We got on ship again. We ended up being on that ship for eleven and a half months. Since majority of the time, we were sitting off the coast of Libya, and it was it was a it was a long time to be on a boat. I tell you. It was a long time, but uh, it was a great tour for me. That So that gave me a lot of experience also. So if you notice now, I got a lot of sea duty. Um, I'm racking up a lot of sea duty now because I did sea duty in Okinawa. Now I'm over in North Carolina doing some more sea duty. Um, so after the 22nd mule, um, we, we was out there for 11 and a half months, came back. I went to a regiment. They, they promoted me in billet wise up to a, a regiment. So then I became uh, the combat logistics regiment 27 SAR major. Now I'm moving up. And so I was in that position for about, uh, I wanna say about six, seven months. And then Afghanistan came up. So now they need a SAR major to go to Afghanistan to be the logistical side of the SAR major. So I ended up going from six months later, going to, uh, going to Afghanistan as the, as, as the SAR major for the, uh, it was, I think we did about, yeah, we were over there seven months. So I went over there and I was a regimental SAR major in Afghanistan for the logistics um again a lot of people don't mention that part of my career that i actually was a sergeant major in combat of a logistical uh group nobody mentions that part you know that should have been the most um contested or if you want to say uh billet that i've had i, I should have got the most animosity about because i was it you know at that time we were in a real combat you know marines we had marines all over the all over the um, Afghanistan traveling and, you know, doing things, you know, putting their lives on the line, you know, and here I was, I was the logistical SAR major for that whole unit. Um, me and a, and a colonel who I work for, um, but nobody mentions that part that I, I was actually in combat with as a logistical SAR major. Why didn't they mention that though? Because people don't, it, because, I was, I think because I was, uh, I was on the logistical side. So I was the logistical SAR major. Was that the part when they were <laughs> looking for uh, Bin Laden? Uh, or, or this post no, no, no. Bin Laden no, or pre? Was at, this was the end of, Af it was getting close to the end of Afghanistan. Okay. Yeah, this was getting close to the end. And now you were, we're up in like 2018, no, we're like in 13, 13. Yeah, we're like there, and there. This is coming to the end of Afghanistan, um, but there's still a lot of forces there that needed to support. So, um, after Afghanistan, I did Afghanistan for seven months again. Um, got back, and I did. Uh, I became uh, equal opportunity. No, I was. Uh, yeah, I sat for a short, short period as the, uh, 
Equal Opportunity Sergeant Major for Marine Logistics Group, which is all logistics in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. I was there working with another colonel, and that's because they didn't know where to put me when I got back from Afghanistan. So I filled in that billet. And then that's when I applied for to be a Marine Expeditionary Unit Sergeant Major, um, which was the historical billet. Uh, and the way that process works is because it's such a significant billet, you have to put in a package or application. And then the top SAR majors, they call them the big nine, they actually look at everybody's package and they vote along with the SAR major Marine Corps who has this last decision on it. Um, so I put my package in, I discussed it with some friends and whatnot, and everybody had already been tracking my, a lot of people had already been tracking my career and realized, you know, this girl got a lot of sea time. She'd been on ship. She's been an ASAR major. She's been a combat element SAR major of a MAGTAP. You know, why can't she be a Marine Expeditionary Unit SAR major? That's the, that's the next step. So I, com I competed with, I think, four other Sergeant Majors for the Marine Expeditionary Unit SAR major billet. And out of all of them, hands down, I had more sea time than them. I had more uh, held more billets on a Marine Expeditionary Unit than them. So I was just like, there's no way they can tell me no. And sure enough, uh, it came back and Sergeant Major Marine Corps actually was came to Camp June and told me um, I, uh, I was selected for the billet to, and that I was gonna be the first female of a Marine Expeditionary Unit um, which was, you know, I, and it still didn't resonate with me until it hit the news. When it hit the news is when all the uh, backlash came, mm. you know, I mean, a lot of backlash came because with the Marine Expeditionary Unit, remember I told you there are several components. That is the fighting, that is the com fighting component for the Marine Corps. You got aviation in there. You got ground elements. You got a command element. And, you know, and that's like the premier job to have, you know, when you want to move up to show that you're a war fighter, you know? So that was a premier job to have. Um, but the experience that I had because they had been putting me in all these billets, I don't think they realized they would set me up for success um, on this, on this uh, billet. So... And can you describe some of the backlash that you received? So uh, the very first backlash I received was, uh, so I, I before it got announced and before the actual ceremony, because there's a ceremony that takes place when you take over that billet, um, I had to go and meet with the guy who was sitting in the billet at the time. Now, his background, He's been in the infantry units and whatnot, but he was not digging the fact that a girl was going to take over his job, you know, and how could this be, you know, because, you know, Marines are kind of, they kind of, uh, they special because they think, you know, they don't, they think they're the only war fighters in the, in the Corps, the men do, um, when they don't realize, you know, we are war fighters. So he wasn't digging the fact that a girl was going to take over so the day of the ceremony, that morning, no, the day before the ceremony, Headquarters Marine Corps came down to Camp Lejeune and they wanted to set up interviews with me prior to the ceremony so they could be ready with the media and everything. So the media, they set it up in the conference room, which was right outside his door. And this guy was so furious that all these people came in and set up outside his door for my interview that he just threw a fit in his office. He slapped, he slammed the keyboard off the desk. He was cursing. And this is all going, you know, with his door closed. And everyone's like, what is going on in there? But I knew he was kind of upset over it. And while we're outside doing the interview, and he just, you know, with an attitude going back and forth, but he destroyed it, he destroyed the office that I was supposed to take over. Um, Did he get disciplined for that? No, they let him throw his fit. You know, he was a senior guy. He just think, you know, he just having. No, they didn't say nothing to him. They let him go with his little fit. 
he was out, he was on his way out the door anyway. So, you know, so they did the interview and everything, but after the meet, after the ceremony, and you got some of the pictures from the ceremony and everything. Yes. It's the guy, who, the guy who's standing in front of me with the sword. That's the guy who destroyed his room, his own office. I say, who does that? So I went and talked to the senior sergeant major and say, look, who destroys their own office? You know, and I was like, I, I'm, I'm not going to be the one to tolerate this stuff. I'm, I'm just not. So he told me, you know, just let him go. And so anyway, after the media hit is when all the emails start coming, when all the letters start coming, visitors coming by the building wanting to see who I was, um, phone calls. So not only was I getting phone calls, so our major Marine Corps was getting phone calls. My MEF star major was getting phone calls about, you know, how could you let this happen? You know, how could you let, you know, this woman be in charge of this unit, you know, be part of, you know, the command team of this unit. And a lot of it was stem from, you know, what they call the old core, those organizations like, you know, they have organization like first Marine division, second Marine division, third Marine division, over at Campus June is second Marine division. You know, those are the division guys, the infantry guys, organizations, associations. They're not even in the core no more. They're old timers. So a lot of old timers will call in because they think they're the protectors of the core. You know, you had people who are not even in the military saying that it's a travesty. What is the Marine Corps doing, putting girls in those positions? And it was just all that. And of course, you know, some of that was because I was black. So it's just not just I was, I was, uh, but they put protection on my uh, on my phone line. They put protection on my email. They put protection on uh, the front door. Nobody could come to my office. Anybody that dropped off a package or whatnot, they had to be, you know, they had to um, have it, make sure it was okay before they gave it to me because it was weirdos coming all over. Um, and this is right here in America. Yeah. yeah. Because of a job. And think because about of a job. Because that job consisted of all those elements I was telling you about, because in the Marine Expeditionary Unit, you have aviation forces, you have ground forces, which is the infantrymen, you have combat element. It's the whole kit and caboodle when it comes to a Marine fighting force. But when I was just a logistics side in combat in Afghanistan with Marines lives, I, 24 hours a day, nobody cared because it was just the fact that, oh, she's just a logistical SAR major, but that was a first also. I don't think they've ever had a regimental female SAR major in combat. So, but because that one component, component of ground combat element infantrymen, it made it look like, I, you know, they made it as if it was a sin for me to be the senior enlisted advisor for combat, ground combat forces of infantrymen. Cause you know, we don't have women in the infantry. We have women who are now holding certain jobs like in tanks, which we didn't have before. We have our first infantry female officer now, but all this has start, started rolling uh, gender thing. And the Sergeant Major the Marine Corps we had at that time was Sergeant Major Barrett, awesome. He was awesome because he put me in a key position and he put three other women in key positions that had never been in a position before. That's so the way he, it should be. He, he really did justice by women. And I thank him every, every time I get a chance for that because without him willing to take the chance to put women in those key positions, you know, we, would, we probably wouldn't be as far as we are right now, the Marine Corps, I just say. So... He was, I mean, even for Paris Island, he put the first female in charge of the Paris Island Depot. You know, he did that. He put the first female in charge of, uh, I shouldn't say in charge of, but um, to being a senior list advisor of Quantico Marine Corps headquarters, you know, base. Um, and then me, and then he put one of the first females to serve in a, a billet in another service, serving with another service, you know? So he, he really did well when it came to women. Um, 
being in key positions. So I was thankful that and I was so happy and I was so blessed that he came to my retirement that I could personally thank him for my career. Um, so he, he, he actually came to my retirement, which I was shocked, but I was thankful for that. And it's, it's sad because if he had been there just a little bit longer, you know, we, would, we probably would have been a lot further, all of us, because when he left, we, that was the last place we all ended up. After that, we all was pushed out into retirement, you know. When you say pushed out, what do you what do you well, how, what do you mean? They just I, I shouldn't like... say I shouldn't say pushed out. Thirty is retirement, but if you get a uh, if you get a key position at a three star general level, you can stay over thirty. And we only have nine of those billets, right? So we've never had a female to hold a as a we I shouldn't say a female. We've never had a female SAR major be a senior enlisted advisor to a three star general. We've, we've all done two stars, but to a three star, that's significant because now you can go over 30 years. So 30 now, years is pretty much the, the cap where you could, they, you could be in a Marine 30 years Corps is your full retirement, yes. Full retirement. Only way you, yeah, only, th only way you stay over 30 years is if it's approved by headquarters Marine Corps and you have to be in a key billet that requires you to go over 30 years. Right. And one of those key billets is to work for a three star general. So we've never in the in the Marine Corps, we've never had a woman to work for a three-star general. So how did you feel when it was time to retire? Do you have mixed no, emotions yeah. or are you were you ready to go at that time? Or after 30 years of putting your life on the line and being traveling the world, how did you feel? It, I'm telling you, I should send you my retirement video. I was joyous. I was happy to be retired. I think we watched it, I think, because Jamie, Jamie Keela. They got uh, it, yeah. Uh, Jackie, uh, Lois, and 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 Linda. I think they all went yeah. to your retirement. Am I yeah. correct? Right. Yes. Now, I that's pretty significant because those three little girls they did they did Marine Corps ROTC at Deerfield High, and so when they were younger, I used and I was in the Corps at the time. I used to tell them, "Okay, who gonna be the Marine?" You know, they say we all gonna be Marines, right? Them and their cousin also. Right. Um, so when I would come home, they would try to test me on Marine Corps knowledge, you know, like, what's your first general order? I say, wait a minute, I'm already the Marine. Let me ask you a question. You know, <laughs> what's your second general order, you know? But they right. were so excited about being in Marine ROTC, but they was like on it. And it's unfortunate that none of them had a chance to, to join because, you know, of different reasons. Um, but they were, they were like my little honorary Marines. So when they came to Paris Island for my retirement, I was so happy for them because, you know, we got the foot up photos and stuff on the footprints. They got to see boot camp. They got to see a parade because before my retirement, they did a uh, graduation parade, you know, where I was the uh, honorary guest for the graduation. And uh, we took plenty of photos. They got to see where, you know, boot camp was. But we they will always test me about Marine Corps knowledge. And I'll be like, no, I'm already the Marine. Y'all got to, you got to tell me the knowledge. But uh, I, I was really blessed for them to come up, you know, and especially kids. She was so, oh, my God, so sweet. I love her, you know, but. So you're fully retired now. How does it feel to be retired? A blessing, you know. I look back on so many things where, you know, I look back on hardships. I look back on, you know, situations. I look back on a lot that, you know, don't, don't get me wrong. It ain't all been peachy. I've been wanting to quit for the past 10 years. The last 10 years, I wanted to quit, you know. But again, I had women, I had other women in my corner saying, you can't quit. You can't leave us. You know, we got to go to 30. Screw these guys. You got to go to 30. You know, we got to keep pushing because there's young girls behind you who, who are cheering us on you know, to be, to make it to 30 years. So I got quite a few friends who uh, made it to 30 years as well, but uh, it was tough. I say the last 10 years was tough. Let me tell you about, you know, I kind of glazed over a lot of my career and I don't really like talking about it, but you got me doing it today. Um, Thank you. It was, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't always easy. I, I had a lot of sacrifices. 
a lot of sacrifices. And if you know, a lot of my time was fast and furious. It didn't give me an opportunity to establish uh, myself as a as someone who had to make a decision on whether I was going to get married, get out of the court. That was always a decision. You know, if I'm a if I'm gonna get married, then what am I gonna do with myself as a career? Am I gonna get out or am I gonna stay in? That's the dilemma every woman have in the military because what man want their woman still, you know, wearing combat boots? You know, it's usually the woman who end up getting out, you know. And then if you stay in and he get out, then how he's gonna follow your career and he establish a career. So it's always a dilemma, you know, with that. And then with so much deployment in my career, it was like, oh, I gotta go to another exercise, I got no. You know, it was just fast and furious. So a lot of that stuff got put on the back burner for me. Next thing I looked up, it was 20 years. Like, wait a minute, I ain't even had no child yet. I ain't got no kids. What am I doing? But, you know, it was all in good. It was all in good uh, decisions that I made. You know, I don't regret any of it, any of it. Because now I, I tell my sisters, when I look at my, you know, when I look at my, uh, when I look at my, my paradise, which I call my bank account, I tell them, I say, I'm so glad. <laughs> when I look at paradise, I was like, oh, I'm so glad, you know, I had a lot of those headaches, you know. When it's it came- good to see that those checks drop in your bank account once every <laughs> month. It doesn't. It? You know what? <laughs> I always thought a lot of my friends who made it 30 years, they're all now either, they're all now divorced. They're single women like me because they just, they just tolerated their their marriages, their whole career. And then when it was retirement, they just says, we don't have to be together no more. They're all single now. And they was like, Lynette, you did it the right way. I said, no, you did it the right way. You got beautiful kids, you experienced being married, you know, you did it, you did it the way you needed to do it, you know, because they had fast and furious careers too. So it was it was okay. I don't regret any of it, um, but it's a lot of sacrifice. I mean, a lot of sacrifice. You sacrifice a lot as a woman being in the military, especially the Marines. You sacrifice your physicalness. You you sacrifice your mental. You sacrifice so much your decisions. And these young girls who are behind me, I take my hat off to them because they are doing things that I don't think I ever could have did. You know, with the new changing in the physical fitness standards and everything, you know, it was tough when I went through, but they got some real challenges. So I wish I wish them the best. I commend them, but keep pushing forward. What is the next chapter for Lynette Wright? You know, since I retired, you know, um, my retirement ceremony, I have to start there, was for my family. My family had never seen any of my ceremonies, really, except the one where I became the MUSAR major. But it was for them to meet my Marine family. So when they came, they got to meet all the people who I've served with, who I lived with, and things like that, you know, as you meet people. And so when I was telling them after, you know, I retired, I'm moving to Texas. I'm moving to Texas to be around all my girls so we can hang out, you know, cause we just been so tight. And the look on their face just dropped. Like, you're not coming back to Florida? I was like, did y'all expect me to? I haven't been back in Florida. But I, I kind of sensed that they really wanted me to come home and it kind of broke my heart cause I didn't know they felt that way. Um, so I decided to stay here. So right now, um, I try to cherish my days with my two oldest sisters because they are really one of the ones, the ones who raised me. And right now they're in their, they're in their late, early sixties, I should say. And I try to uh, make their life as comfortable as possible. So right now that's all I've been focusing on. I finished, uh, I did some education. I finished my degree since I've been retired. But at the same time, I just been focusing on surrounding them with love and my appreciation for them. You know, I do whatever I can for them, you know, make their life easy. I don't care if it's, you know, get up and get a glass of water for them. You know, they say they want something, I make it happen. But the chapter for me, I, I, I haven't figured out what I want to do when I grow up. You know, still, it's so many things out there. 
I know I didn't want another nine to five and I didn't want another level of responsibility that I had because the, I needed to decompress. You know, you, you're looking at the decompress, Lynette. You know, you'd have caught me about three years ago. You, you probably had a whole different person. Um, but this is me decompress. You know, it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been this, you, you'd have seen a whole different person. So I don't think there's much more and I don't see myself in a big high paying job. I like public service. Right now, I sit on the Boca Raton Housing Authority Board, where I'm the vice chair. So I sit on that board right now because I like doing the volunteer work and I like, you know, to be part of that because housing is terrible right now. It is. So I want to understand, you know, how things can be better for people who are who need housing, how things can be better in the programs that we have, and also to learn because I don't know a lot about you know, this side of, uh, of, of life, you know, I know a lot of military stuff, but this side, I'm still learning. So that's why I uh, volunteered to sit on the corporate tone housing authority board. So I'm the vice chair for that. I've been doing that for a few months now. So I'm learning a lot with that. And I think um, probably some more public service somewhere because um, I do like service and I want to give back just like you all with your podcast. Right. Um, I just, I, I just like to do things like that now. How can I make somebody else's life a little bit better? It's no, it's, it's no longer about me. It's never been about me. Um, that's why I try to make sure I make myself available for anybody who need anything, you know, so. Any thoughts of running for public office? No. You know, the politics I shared in the Marine Corps, it was pretty political in my last few years. And um, I just don't, I don't like, I, I just don't like it. I, I, I just rather be in service. You know, I don't want to be in a key posi- political position at all. We get because, asked the same question. Yeah, because mm-hmm. it's just too messy. It's too messy. They dig in you. They character assassinate you. And that stuff is just so, it's just terrible that you have the character assassinate someone because they're challenging you in a, in a, in a position. You know, so I can't, I can't handle that stuff. Right. Any you thoughts know? on writing a book? You know, um, somebody else said that to me also about putting a book together. Um, I think I'm thinking about it. Maybe Do um, it. we would buy it. Do it. Thank you. Yeah. You have a good story. Great story to tell. I appreciate it. Thank you all so much. I don't, and, and I'm gonna tell you, you all are special because I've never told this story. I've never talked about myself this long at any point in time. Not even when I had to. Well, speak we're glad you did it with us. Yeah, I, I, I gotta, I gotta share it with you. You're my old Popeyes buddy, you know. Well, so. yeah, we worked at Popeyes <laughs> uh, in Deerfield, right on Hillsboro, way back in the '80s. I, I believe it was the early '80s. We worked together at Popeyes. <laughs> I know. I got to, well, next time I talk to guests, I got to remind her of that. I got to <laughs> yeah. remind her of that. You well, know? you certainly has had an impressive military career, a five-star career. You put your life on the line for 30 years uh, for our, our country, and now you are serving the community. We, will, we the Adams Brothers Podcast, Daryl and my brother Wayne, we would like to thank you for your five-star service thank to you. our country thank you so much for putting your oh, life on the line and you. serving our country and uh honorably and uh, we really appreciate it from the bottom of our hearts thank you we when we, we're happy to see you that you made it out alive and we're hey, happy to God. i hope we hope you live another 60 years and enjoy that pension check that drops in your <laughs> bank account once a month we want to see you get everything you deserve okay because you I really you. deserve it and uh, you really have an impressive military career and thank you so much for uh taking the time out of your schedule to come and talk with us uh on our adams brothers podcast and uh we really we just really thank you thank you thank you so much we've been talking to retired sergeant major lynette wright she spent 30 years in in the united states marine corps and um Man, this has been wonderful just listening to you talk and and, and t- tell us about your military career. And we just want to thank you so much. Hoorah, Semper Fi. Yeah. Well, thank you, uh, retired 
Sergeant Major Lynette Wright. Thank you so much for stopping by the Adams Brothers podcast and come back when you write your book. Come back and tell us about it. We will we will be the first one to buy your book. I promise you. I will. Okay. Thank you, Lynette. And uh, we'll be seeing you around soon, I'm sure. And uh, thank you for stopping by our podcast. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye bye. Have a wonderful evening.